Good morning, everyone. Happy Palm Sunday. Love you, Kevin. It's good to have you here. It's good to be amongst family today. It really is. It's a privilege to be here. It's a privilege to stand here. It was a privilege to be here um, praying with some of the team this morning. It's great to see Charles and Evelyn. It's great to see Yimmy and Sada. It's great to see Bryce, Nick Garcia, so many of uh, just, just family. Um, Javier, just grateful for this house. I'm grateful for this opportunity um, to be together, not only today, but, but this week, this holy week. Uh, today is Palm Sunday, and we'll, we'll get into that. Today is the day that, that Jesus rode in to Jerusalem, the final week that the world would know the world as it is. On Monday, Jesus clears out the temple. <clears throat> it is written, my house will be a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. On Tuesday, Jesus preaches the parable of the ten virgins. And this is really a lesson in staying vigilant, staying sober, staying alert. The bridegroom is coming, and there are ten virgins who are waiting for the wedding banquet. And it's an interesting nuance in the scripture, but all ten of them fall asleep. And I think that's a uh, a gentle warning to all of us that whether we're ready with oil or not ready without oil, we can fall asleep on this journey. And we know in that parable, the bridegroom does come. Five are ready with oil lamps full of oil. The others are out scattering trying to find the oil. Five are brought into the wedding banquet. The other five arrive late and Jesus says, I never knew you. Jesus is coming back. Jesus is coming back, but I do have news for you. The Jesus that was on that cross is not coming back. That's been finished. On Wednesday, Jesus' disciple Judas agrees to betray Jesus. On Thursday, it's Maundy Thursday, the Last Supper. Maundy in Latin means commandment. So it's Commandment Thursday. The commandment being Jesus to his disciples in humility, love one another when I'm gone. And we see that Jesus prays in the Garden of Gethsemane, asks the Lord, you can do anything, would you take this cup, but your will be done. And Jesus is betrayed and arrested. Good Friday, Jesus is tried, crucified, taken down and placed in a tomb. This Friday, as my wife Michelle mentioned, we're excited to gather. We're going to be gathering uh, at Nature of God Nursery which is really exciting. Nature of God is a nursery that was birthed uh, by the Lord through two really, really special people in this house, a family, um, Angel and Silvana. Uh, I wish we could honor them in person, but they're uh, traveling with family today. But they have a nursery, and it is gorgeous, and it is why we have all of these beautiful palm branches and trees here today. Uh, they donated them for the day, but we're going to meet on Friday at Nature of God um, for a Good Friday service. Uh, we really feel the Lord speaking in this hour that we are supposed to gather. We are not supposed to miss a moment. We are supposed to marry instead of Martha this week. And um, I would encourage all of you to check your heart and to check your schedule and to try to be available. This place, Nature of God, prophetically, I'm telling you, it is going to be a place of revival. It is going to be a hub of one name. It is going to be a lighthouse. That place is anointed. It, it, there's a God purpose behind it. It's only about 10 minutes from this location. So I really encourage you, um, 
to, to mark off your calendars. It's at 7 p.m. We're going to worship. Our team has a special service. Uh, I think we're going to grill some food as well. Um, so it's really going to be a good time. You can check our Instagram and, and our emails for that as well. Saturday, Jesus' body lay in the tomb. The disciples come out of hiding and mourn openly. And then Resurrection Sunday. Easter, the tomb is empty. And this is Jesus' victory and his triumph. It's his victory over sin and death. And this victory is applied to all of those who are united with him by trusting in the death that atoned for our sins and by believing in the resurrection of a holy, eternal Savior. Amen? That's the finished work of Christ and Christ crucified and Christ resurrected. Tetelestai, in the Greek, it is complete. The debt has been forgiven. You're saved by grace through faith. That is the gospel of Jesus Christ and Christ crucified and Christ resurrected. Your salvation is Christ crucified, Christ resurrected, and nothing else. Your adoption into an eternal sonship and daughtership, an eternal kingdom, is through Christ crucified, Christ resurrected, and nothing else. Your freedom, your freedom comes from Christ crucified, Christ resurrected, and nothing else. Your true born-again identity, the real you, the purpose behind the creation that is God living inside of you, it comes from Christ crucified, Christ resurrected, and nothing else. Adding anything, good deeds, good works. It's not Christ on a tree and you help the old lady down the street with groceries. It's not works. It's not confessing to a priest. It's not believing that Jesus is a prophet, but not the Messiah. It's not faith and self-loathing. It's not individualism and Jesus. Trusting your heart and your own truth. It's not cheap grace. I'm essentially a good person, so I'm going to ignore my sin over here because I do good things over there. These are false gospels. The gospel of Jesus Christ is the Father sends the Son, the Son obediently goes to the cross, is crucified, and then is resurrected. And we're adopted into that kingdom through faith and grace. Revelation twenty two eighteen 18 says, I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this scroll, if anyone adds anything to them, God will add to that person the plagues described in this scroll. That's the gospel. We're going to read about Palm Sunday. We're going to read about Jesus entering into Jerusalem. I'm kind of, kind of going to take a hybrid uh, reading today between the gospel of Matthew and Luke. We'll be in the Old Testament on the back end of the message. So for this, you can go to Matthew if you want. It might be easier to follow on the screens because we're going to jump back and forth a little bit. Matthew 21, verses 1 to 3. Lord, I pray this morning that you would anoint my tongue, that you would anoint my heart with holiness, and I pray that you would anoint every ear in this space to hear. 
Faith comes through hearing. I pray that you would anoint every heart. I pray that you would anoint all of our attention spans, that we might hear clearly what you want to impart into us today. We are here, Lord, because we want to know you. We want a deeper revelation of you. We want to understand. We want freedom. We want to, we want to praise you. We want to worship you. We thank you for the word, the word that is alive. The word that we, we might have read 20, 30, 50, 100 times, and it's going to touch us in a new way right now. Activate this room. Activate faith. Holy Spirit, come in fire and win on this message, on this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Matthew 21, 1 to 3 says, As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. Verses 4 to 5, this took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, see, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest heaven! And when we flip over to Luke 19, we read, some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. In any Near Eastern context, any procession of any king would have been conspicuous. It would have been pomp and pageantry. And it would have been entourages. The finest horse, the finest thoroughbred that any king owned would be what he would be riding on, a war horse. Jesus came in alone on a borrowed donkey. But make no mistake, his entry into Jerusalem bears unmistakable resemblance to that of a royal procession. Very, very similar to when Solomon entered Gion to become king, Jesus came in on a colt. The cloaks that were spread out along the roads, essentially a red carpet. The palm branches, a sign of goodness and victory and pageantry and hope. The shout of Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. While it is a, a praise, it's also a plea. Hosanna meaning save, please, or, or please deliver us. You have the Jewish people asking for deliverance. They want to be saved from Roman oppression. What they don't know is that they need to be saved from their sin. And Jesus would be worshipped. It's a powerful scripture. Do, do we think that the, the stones would actually cry out and worship? Probably not. I think it's poetic. But what Jesus is saying is that those rocks have a better chance of start, starting to praise my name than of me coming into this holy week without praise, honor, and glory. The Lord will be worshipped. The Father loves His Son too much. The Father is not going to let His Son walk into our suffering without praise, honor, and glory. The rocks will cry out.
We pick it up in Luke 19, verses 41 to 44. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. Jesus is weeping because he knows what he's walking into on that colt. And he loves Jerusalem. Jerusalem will not accept Jesus. They've they've been waiting for a visit from God. And here is God in the flesh, and they've missed it. And Jerusalem will be destroyed. You can read about it. It happens in 70 A.D. The Romans take over Jerusalem and they destroy the temple. It's almost unthinkable. 150-foot walls, this beautiful temple. Do your homework on this. It's one of the most gruesome attacks you will ever read about. What happened was, is they allowed all the pilgrims in during Passover. But then they didn't let them go. They kept them captive. So then what happened? There was a food shortage. So they start killing, they start murdering, they start burning, they start upheaving the whole place, and everybody's starving to death, which is one of the worst ways that you can die outside of a crucifixion. And so they're starving, and now they start to cannibalize each other. Jerusalem is destroyed. They didn't recognize that God was riding into their city on a horse. And in Matthew 21.10, it says, When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city, not one or two people, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is that? They didn't know who Jesus was. And so today, my hope and my prayer is that all of us would leave with a clear understanding of who Jesus is. If you could, turn to Isaiah 53, which is where we're going to be for most of the rest of the morning. Isaiah the prophet in the Old Testament. Who is Jesus? If you've been with us this month, this holy month, we've gone from belief to faith to who do you say I am? And now we ask ourselves, who is Jesus? The book that you have in your hands is the answer. Everything in this book points back to Jesus. Everything. The Old Testament is the anticipation of Christ. The Gospels are the incarnation of Christ. The book of Acts is the proclamation of Christ. The epistles are the explanation of Christ. And Revelation is the glorification of Christ. Your book, your Bible, the Word, John 1, is Jesus. It points to Jesus. I would implore, I would encourage, I would exhort that if you don't feel like you understand who Jesus is, be in your Word. It, it, it's life. It's essential. It's alive. And if the whole Bible is about Jesus, then Isaiah 53 is all about Jesus as well. The whole chapter. This is one of the most profound, sad, sorrowing, hopeful, amazing chapters in all of the Bible. Isaiah 53. It's not that long. Yet, it has eternal trinity, incarnation, humiliation, rejection, 
unjust trial, conviction, execution, the accomplishment of redemption, the resurrection, ascension, exaltation, and the coronation of Jesus. And it's all written 700 years before Christ. It's insane. Isaiah, pinpoint accuracy, absolute to the T, the whole gospel. This is the first gospel. Gospel, an account of Jesus. If you, if you were only allowed to, to put in your back pocket one chapter, this would be the one. This, this, <laughs> this is what you need. You need the story of Jesus. You need to know why he came. You need to know what he did. And you need to know what, the, what he did and the freedom that that offers you. It's all in Isaiah 53. Seven centuries before Jesus. And this is the chapter that the rabbis, the Jews, do not want to read. They think that this is about Israel. Israel didn't willfully suffer. This is about a man, and it's the man Jesus. Almost every line of Isaiah 53 is referred to in the New Testament. Jesus quotes it. It's mentioned in Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1 Corinthians, Hebrews, 1 Peter, 1 John, Revelation. It's a story of salvation. It's the story of Jesus, but it's also a lament. This is fascinating. Not only is this a prophecy from Isaiah that goes from 700 B.C., to Jesus, but if you'll notice in the text, the verbs are in the past tense, meaning this is actually Israel looking back at the cross and the finished work, and what are they doing? They're groaning. Oh, we missed it. He was right there. We didn't see it. That was who we were waiting for the whole time. This is a, a little bit quirky. Isaiah 53 is the suffering servant, but it starts at the end of Isaiah 52. So you guys can follow along, verses 13 to 15. It says, see, my servant will act wisely. This is God speaking. He will be raised and lifted up and highly exalted. Just as there were many who were appalled at him, his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any human being and his form marred beyond human likeness. So he will sprinkle many nations and kings will shut their mouths because of him. For what they were not told, they will see and what they have not heard, they will understand. Jesus is the servant. This is Isaiah speaking, but speaking God speaking through Isaiah, God saying, see, my servant. Jesus is the servant. Servant meaning slave, meaning property. I think we get this a little background, backwards sometimes. Jesus says, I didn't come to be served. I came to serve. Well, he didn't come to serve us. He came to serve his father. You understand? He didn't come to serve us came to serve the Father. Jesus doesn't have an opinion. Jesus doesn't have a preference. Jesus doesn't have a motive. Jesus doesn't have any of it. Read John. It's all over. I don't do anything unless the Father wills it. I say what the Father says. I go where the Father goes. Total obedience. Jesus is the picture of perfection on earth. Total obedience. 
to the Father. Yes, they are equal. Yes, they are part of the triune. Yes, they are one. But there are different functions. And the Father sends the Son, and the Son obeys. He serves the, the Father. Does he serve us? Byproduct? Yes. Absolutely. He serves us with his mercy. He serves us with his grace, with his kindness, with his compassion, with his patience, with his blessings, with his for forgiveness, with his provision, with his teaching, with his wisdom, with his understanding. He serves us in more ways than we could ever imagine. But he didn't come to serve us. He came to serve him. This is the will of the Father. See, my servant will act wisely. He will be exalted. He came to serve his Father and give his life as a ransom for many. Isaiah 53, 1 says, Who has believed our message and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Now it's Isaiah speaking through Israel. Who has believed our message and, and whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? The arm of the Lord is the power of God. Basically, this is almost sarcasm. They're, Israel's looking back and almost saying, like, did anybody see this? Anyone? Did, who has seen this? Who believed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. Jesus was not a child prodigy, a wonder kid. He grew up quietly and vulnerably like a plant. Patiently. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. We like desirable. We, we like desirable. We like tall, dark, and handsome. We like chiseled jawbones and high cheekbones. We like symmetrical. We like hourglass figures. We like charisma, energy, charm. We like white teeth. We like power. We like presence. We like Gucci. We like Louis Vuitton. We like nice, fast cars. We like shiny things. They say that diamonds are a girl's best friend, but not the Holy Spirit. We like desirable. We like posture. We like presence. We like to be seen and we like to see. We like desirable. They wanted a desirable savior. They didn't want a homeless, meandering preacher that hung out with smelly fishermen. It didn't make any sense. It made no sense. They couldn't see it because in their mind, that's not what a savior looks like. He didn't look like the men of rank. He didn't look like the elite, the chief priests, the Sadducees, the Pharisees. He wasn't dressed in fine robes. Verse 3, he was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised and we held him in low esteem. Again, this is groaning. This is, this, this is, we, we held him in low esteem. Jesus suffered. The, this is Passion Week. Passion meaning suffering. This is the suffering week for him. But he suffered long before the Passion. He, he was tempted. He went 40 days without food. He had no place to lay his head. He was rejected in his hometown. He was plotted against, betrayed, abandoned. The, the, the text says he was despised. The Hebrew for despised is non-existent. It's, they couldn't even look at him. They couldn't even acknowledge him. He 
Verse 4 and 5, surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. The punishment that brought peace was on him. That was what Michelle was reading. This whole chapter is a substitutional atonement. He's crushed for our iniquities. We get peace. He's wounded, we're healed. He's charged guilty, we're deemed innocent. He dies, we live. It's, it's a complete substitution. Jesus taking what we deserve, our, our sin, taking our sin, and then putting his righteousness on us. I want to show you something in this book. It's fascinating to me. The, the, the book is so alive and God is so meticulous and creative. There are 66 books in the Bible. Genesis to Revelation, 66 books. 39 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New Testament. In the book of Isaiah, there are 66 chapters. 39 of judgment and 27 of salvation. It's nuts. In, in, in the 27 chapters in Isaiah of salvation, the first nine are the salvation of Israel, the second, the salvation of sinners, and the third, the salvation of the universe. And in the middle of the salvation of sinners, in the middle of the 27 chapters of salvation in Isaiah, we get Isaiah 53, 6. Isaiah 53, 6, saying, We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. This is where nobody gets singled out, unless you don't belong to we all. We all have gone astray. In the middle part of the salvation part of Isaiah, prophesying the Messiah. We all have fallen short. But here's the issue. This goes beyond falling short behaviorally. Because look what the text says. It says, each of us has turned to our own way. Our own way. Turning to our own way means our own nature. By nature, we are sick. Sorry, it's the truth. If you don't think so, you don't need that cross. It's our nature. It's our fallen nature. It starts very early in the Bible. It's in Genesis. So we understand that that's where we're at. We all, like sheep, have gone our own way. At some point, we have been in total rebellion to what God wanted for our lives, for humanity, for creation. God understood this. He sent his son. His son came and died on a tree and was resurrected. But this is why, friends, hear me, the behavior modification gospel will never work because it is a false gospel from hell. Behavior modification is not what the blood paid for. It will always leave you full of guilt, shame, and unbelief. Why? Because you'll fail. Why? Because it is your nature to. You understand? You're not good enough. You need the blood. We all have fallen short. We all need a savior. We all need the blood. Nobody gets out of that. Nobody. Nobody. And we sit here and white knuckle it and try to do better. You don't do better. You fall in love with him. 
Your behavior lines up after the revelation of who he is and what he did. Your, your behavior lines up when you get a taste, taste and see. Your behavior lines up when you see the signs and you see the wonders and you see the miracles. Your behavior lines up when you realize who you used to be in the pit of hell that you got saved from, that now you get to walk in freedom. Now you get to walk with your shoulders held high. Now you get to walk in joy and confidence. Now you have a purpose. Now you actually have a real purpose. It has nothing to do with a paycheck. It has nothing to do with the apartment you live in. It's a kingdom purpose. It's real life. The truth, the way, and the life. I'm not going to read really much of the rest of it. To summarize, he was oppressed. When you read this chapter, it says that he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to slaughter. I was doing some studying this week for this, this sermon, and I, I kind of regret it. Actually, I really love animals. I, I, I was curious. I'm like, oh, wh why? Why do these lamb, they, what is up with this? And I Googled a slaughter lamb on YouTube. Like, I watched it. It's awful. They don't do anything. They just go, and their life is done. They don't put up a fight. They don't make a sound. And that was Jesus. Actually, one lamb leads all of them to slaughter, and they actually call it the Judas lamb. He was judged. There was an illegal trial, which was a total mockery. Total mockery, a sham. Arrested for doing nothing, nothing illegal. They couldn't find any charge against him to put him to death. Pontius Pilate, I think, was embarrassed for everybody. And he's like, I, I see no charge. What, what, what are, why is he here? It was brutal. It was terrible. The whole thing was a comedy. It was a joke to the Romans. They, they, they created a crown of thorns and they placed it on his head. That went into his skull. They put a staff into his right arm and then beat him over with it. They put a sign up that said, King of the Jews. They were mocking him. It was sarcasm. It was a joke. It was pathetic. They put a purple robe on him. They spit on him. And they got down on their knees and they said, King of the Jews, in a mocking tone, the God of the universe. This is the Passion Week. Not a single person of the generation protested. How about that? You're walking around, you're teaching, you're, you're eating bread with people, you're, you're loving on people, you're healing people. You're delivering people from demons. The blind are seeing. He's going to trial illegally. There's no, there, there's no legitimate charge against him. Not one human soul was willing to risk their life and be like, this is, this is out of bounds. Everybody fled. Everybody just let him go to his death. It's all in Isaiah 53. He was put to death, assigned a grave with the wicked. God wasn't going to let that happen. Kind of like the rocks crying out, Jesus was not going to not be worshipped. Jesus was not going to be buried with you and I. Not a chance. So God sent Joseph of Arimathea, one of Jesus' wealthy disciples who had built a tomb for himself, that Jesus would be placed in. He was sinless. He had done no violence. No deceit had come from his mouth. That's Holy Week. And in Isaiah 53, verse 10, it says, Yet, yet, meaning despite all that, it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, 
He will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. And I'll stop there. The rest of the chapter does become encouraging, and it does, you do hear, uh, it goes from Israel speaking to God speaking through Isaiah. Maybe Pastor Jesus will touch on it next week. I'm excited for his word, but you see the other side of the cross, the redemption. But this scripture is interesting. It was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. Like, we've got to understand this just a little bit. Nobody wants to suffer. I can feel a little heaviness in the room. I get it. Sorry, we don't do Easter eggs around here. Guys, like, it's not what we do. We don't do it. We don't. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the book. It's the Bible. If we did the other stuff, if we did the false gospel stuff, there wouldn't be any empty seats. People don't want to hear this. If Jesus had to suffer because it was the Lord's will, what are we so confused about that we might not have to suffer? It might just be that it's the Lord's will. Jesus didn't go around suffering. He went right through it. And the currency was blood. That's the currency for forgiveness and right standing. And I'm going to close today, guys, with with a thought. All of us want one thing. Any well-adjusted, sane human being wants one thing. We want to be right with God. It's true. It doesn't matter who your God is. You want to be right with God. If you're Hindu, you want to be right with many gods. If you're Muslim, you want to be right with Allah, but you don't have any interest in a Holy Spirit or a Jesus as your Messiah. If you're Buddhist, then you want to be right with self-discipline. If you're new age, then you want to be right with the universe. And if you're atheist, you want to be right with yourself because you are your own God. There is no other God than the triune God. God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit is the only God. It is the only God. He is the only God. And you can sit down and you can challenge anybody that tells you differently. We are not ashamed of the gospel. We are not ashamed of Jesus. There's four things that make you God. And if you can check every box, you are God. Let's see if any of us fit the bill. Omnipotent. Omnipotent. All powerful, all powerful. If you cannot make the blind see, if you cannot make the lame walk, if you cannot make the dead come to life, you are not God. If you cannot make a storm stop, you are not God. If you cannot make thousands of loaves and fish fall from the sky out of a few little morsels of food, you are not God. omniscient, all-knowing. If you don't know the heart of every man, if you don't know the names of unborn children's great, 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 great granddaughters, if you don't know that, you are not God. Omnipresent, ever-present. If you cannot be in all spaces for eternity, you are not God. God is 700 years in the future he's 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 everywhere he's ever present 
He's in this space right now. He's in your heart. He's in your finances. He's in your, your, he's in your, your, your desires, your wants. He knows every hair on your head. The thoughts of him are more than the sands of the earth towards you, and they're all good. And while he's all doing that, and while he's working good work in you and through you, he's doing the same thing for the person next to you at the same time, and the person next to you, and the person next to you. He's doing the same thing for the prostitute. He's doing the same thing for somebody in a different country that doesn't believe in him. He's doing the same thing for people that are in ISIS. He created all people. Ever present. He needs to be eternal. If your God was ever born or your God ever died, he's not God. God never was born. He's a spirit. He's eternal. Jesus, yes, did he die an earthly life for three days? Yes, but it was to make a point and it was to save us. God does not die. God was not born. Those are the qualifications, so you can bring those to the table and challenge Christianity all you want. Is it scandalous? Is it exclusive? Yes. It's not our gospel. It's not our Bible. We didn't write it. But it is our job to preach it and build the kingdom and send it forward. We want to be right with God. There is only one God. And the reason that we want to be right with God, why is it? We don't want to be right with God to have an easy life. Some of us don't want an easy life. We choose hard. We choose less than. We choose missionary. We choose serving. We choose the military, whatever that might look like. Not everybody wants to be wealthy. Some people don't care. But what, what, why do we all want to be right with God? We want peace. Everybody wants to feel the peace of God. Because that is what you were designed to walk in. In the cool of the day, no work, no stress, no hang-ups, no sickness, no illness, just peace. It's what we are all after. And the people that don't know Jesus are trying to find their peace in pleasure. They're trying to find their peace in their jobs. They're trying to find their peace in their cute kindergartner. And all of it is perishable and fleeting, and it never fully satisfies. So then we look to other things. We look to clothes. We look to shoes. We look to houses. We look to drugs. We look to alcohol. We look to sex. We look to we, power businesses, what, it, it, it does not provide peace. Look at this story. Jesus on Palm Sunday is going into Jerusalem on a horse. The name of Jerusalem means city of peace. Jesus is the prince of peace riding on a colt which is the symbol of peace. Peace. Isaiah 53 says his punishment brought us peace. And Jesus is looking at Jerusalem. He's looking at the temple. He's looking at the people. And they blew it and they missed it. And he says, if you, even you, had only known on this day, today, the day that the Lord came, would bring you peace. He is our peace. That is our message. Our message is not the prosperity gospel. Follow Jesus. He'll take care of all your finances. Following Jesus doesn't mean you're never going to get sick. Following Jesus probably might make your life harder than it would have been if you would have just ran around in rebellion. Because now you have a conscience. Now you have the Holy Spirit. It's a riddle. Jesus solves it. When you go to Exodus 34, way back in the Bible, verses 6 to 7, 
you get kind of a complex picture of God. And he passed in front of Moses proclaiming, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love, faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands, forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin, Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generations. So if you don't have spiritual eyesight here, you're pretty confused. I don't understand. I love the compassion part. The grace is good. Definitely like slow to anger, bounding in love and faithfulness, wonderful. Love to thousands, forgiving all the wickedness and rebellion. It, it, that all sounds great unless you're guilty. Jesus Christ is the answer to this riddle. You're either on one side of it or you're on the other. It's a pretty fair deal if you really analyze it. The Father creates... Mankind disobeys, sin enters the picture. God does not want to be separated from his children. So he sends his son, his son who was with him since forever. They, not since the beginning of time. They invented time, before time. Jesus and the Holy Spirit and the Father all one. And Jesus said, I'm actually going to suit you up as a man and make you suffer all the things that men suffer. I'm going to make you the most sacrificial lamb in the history of the universe. You will die a death that is uncomprehensible to, to mankind. You will be unmistakable. You, will, you, you won't even be able to, see, you won't even look like a human being. And then you'll rise again. And then our part of the bargain is that we just believe. It's as simple as that. We just believe. We talk about how hard this walk can be, how much Jesus asks. Does he? The guilty are the unrepentant and unbelieving sinners. Jerusalem didn't believe and they were destroyed. So many of them still don't believe. Jesus took our sin. What is sin? Sin is choosing something other than God. And what does sin bring on? Separation. Yes, the Bible says nothing can separate us from the love of God. Yes, you cannot be suffered. You can, once, you, once, you, once, you, once you're with God, you can never be separated from his love, but you can be separated from his presence. He's there, but you won't feel him. Why? Because you're in rebellion. It's sin. It's the metallic stain of sin. It's icky. How do you think? Think about this, guys. How do you feel if you're a believer in here, if you're walking with the Lord, if you believe in Jesus, if you have a heart that's earnestly after him, how do you feel when you sin? It's, it's you feel out of character. You withdraw. You feel shame. You feel like... You feel like you, you do, like you took ten steps forward and a hundred back. You feel like giving up. And then you start to hear things that are not the Lord's voice, and you start to believe those things. And one little sin can take you down a rabbit hole of just total disobedience and total disalignment from what you were created in your purpose. That's how sin affects us. Jesus took every sin from every believer, past, present, and future, put it in a cup, and drank it. How do you think it made him feel? It made him sweat blood. It made him in anguish say, Father, you can do anything. Will you take this cup from me? but your will be done. 
And the Lord's will was that he was going to drink the cup. So he drank all that sin. And he cleansed it in three hours on a tree. While the people that he died for mocked him. It's separation from God that makes us lose our peace. Catch this. When the Lord says, Father, why have you forsaken me? It's because that holiness, bless you, holiness can only hang out with holiness. And here's the Father and the Son together for all of eternity. And for the first time ever, Jesus experiences what it's like to not have the presence of God. It makes him sweat blood. It makes him suffer to the point of death. He dies. So yes, sin is a big deal. separates us. But this the cross the cross gives us our salvation. When we understand what Jesus did, when we recognize it, when we actually believe it, and we believe that he raised from the dead, when, when, we, when we believe that we are now entering into an eternal holy kingdom, the room has already been prepared for us. We are in right standing. We are justified. We are qualified. We are blameless. And the Holy Spirit now lives inside of us as a friend. The power and the Spirit of God now lives inside of you, not so you can sit around wondering about how bad you used to be, so that you can actually go use the power of the Holy Spirit to do what he asks you to do, to go out and to make disciples, to preach the good news of the gospel, to cast out demons, to put your hands on the sick and heal them in Jesus' name. It's total freedom. But I want to remind somebody today, it's not a ticket that you punch one time. This cross is a daily invitation to obedience. It's a daily invitation to peace. It's a daily invitation to freedom. It's a daily invitation to healing. It is a daily invitation to walking in the purpose and the call of your life. You need the blood of Jesus today just as much as you ever have. We are to pick up our cross every single day. I know that Palm Sunday can be a little heavy. Of course, guys, we're talking about a man coming to go on a tree and die for us. Hello, that is, that is heavy. But there is another Sunday. And I'm telling you guys, I'm looking at faces, I'm looking into eyes. It's life and death. Your job is to invite people into this place next week. Your job is to tell people about Jesus and not be ashamed. Your job is to be okay looking a little foolish to the world. Because we look at the world and we think that's pretty foolish. The cross is a daily invitation and I want to worship with you guys and I want to invite you. If you do not know this Jesus, if somehow you ended up here as a non-believer, somebody brought you in, you did not, maybe you had a misunderstanding about who Jesus was or is. 
Maybe, maybe you caught a revelation. Maybe the Holy Spirit touched you. Our prayer team wants to pray with you. Our prayer team wants to pray with you and welcome you into the kingdom where you say, I believe. I believe you are who you are. I don't want to be Jerusalem. I don't want to groan. I don't want to miss it. I, I believe. But as we worship today, this is an invitation. It's an invitation for every single person in this house to surrender all over again. To be washed clean. If you need healing, come to the altar and get your healing. It's for today. You're walking out healed in the name of Jesus. If you are oppressed by a demonic spirit, the spirit of death, the spirit of fear, the spirit of lust, come to the altar. We will cast that demon out and you are leaving free out of bondage because of what that paid for. You don't think so? I invite you to believe. I invite you to believe in what that cross not only represents, that's not just a symbol, that's an act of obedience. That, that, that is Jesus going down to hell, taking death and the grave. And every time you go to that cross, you are invited through nothing other than grace through faith to cross a threshold from the secular to the sacred from the common to the uncommon, and from the profane to the holy. It's the greatest invitation ever. It's the invitation of Jesus Christ. Let's worship.
surrender it all to you, Lord. It's the only way we find what we're seeking. Any semblance of control, any true power that can change a human heart. Healing, freedom. In one name, Jesus. Lord, we cannot express our gratitude did 2,000 years ago, what you did today in this room, what you're doing. We submit ourselves to you. There's so much power in surrender, collectively, just before you. Dwell us in a new measure of anointing, Father, that we might leave this place beacons of light. I just pray, Holy Spirit, as we go on, through this holy week, Father, that we all spend more time in our word, that we all spend more time reflecting on your sacrifice. And as we do so and go about our day to day, that people would notice. People would say, hey, there's something different about her, something different about him. And they would get curious, Father. You are working something good. We believe it. We profess our faith. We will not stop. So continue to use us as we stay surrendered. Continue to use us to do good. Father, we are your hands and feet. We submit ourselves to you. Lord, be in every space through this week as we gather, as we gather to pray, as we gather on Good Friday at Nature of God. Father, you reveal yourself to every single one of us in a new way. May we, may we have a deeper and a better and clearer understanding of your nature, your character, your love, your perfection. God, I thank you that you are a God that we do not understand. Oh, how mighty, how powerful. Jesus, I thank you for every single person in this room. I thank you for every prayer warrior. I thank you for every good Samaritan. I thank you, God, for every humble servant, Lord, under the sound of my voice. Jesus, may we carry your one name with us until we gather again. I love them all so much, but I know that you love them even more. Jesus, we thank you. And it's in your mighty name that we pray. Amen, amen, amen. Have a great week.